Yes. Oh, did you repeat at 11? I'll, I'll write it up. Oh. But a bit more like 11.30, just to make sure that it's done. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, we might be crowded in here, and I can, you know, I can go longer. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I wasn't going to necessarily say, hey, two different sessions. We can just, people get tired and want to leave, other people come in or something. I don't think that should work. But anyway, so let's write this up. So first midterm, first midterm. You said was Wednesday. The 26th. Today, right? Wednesday, yeah. the 26th. Since it's my birthday, can I have an A? Yeah, Today. Okay. Study sessions. Here, in this room. Yes. Here. Uh, Friday of next week. Let's um, I, you know, I, you should have the uh, study guide. I meant to make some more copies, but it would be able to have it, and I can make some. You know, because we don't have. If yeah. you're unable to go to that, is the study guide a paper representation? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If, 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 tests will come. All the things you have to know, it says right in there. Yes. It says, know this, know this. Yes. 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 It's all right there. And, um, uh, and, and if I forgot to talk about something and it's on the study guide, but I forgot to talk about it, it won't be on the test. And only if I talk about it. Uh, and I'm not picking things out of the book that I didn't get to or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I want you, you know, these things. I'm a, I'm a science nerd. I like this kind of stuff. <laughs> some of you think it's fascinating. Some of you think, ah, it's another hurdle. I have to jump over <laughs> to get a degree or something. But this stuff actually does have relevance, you know, to to your own lives. And so, you know, I hope that you take it somewhat. You know, think of it as as being not just information you have to get, but have have some meaning. And we're going to be talking about some of that today, as far as the meaning is concerned, because we're going to talk about energy and all that. And and you. It, Granted, you know, you, if you eat lunch, you're not thinking about how it's being digested and all the insides and how they're working and how they're transferring energy from one form to I know you don't think about that. You don't need to. But still, it's kind of useful to see how all this stuff is interrelated. Anyway, I'm a science nerd, so I'm just talking. But. Okay. All right. So, um, study session. So, there's a study session. And as I said, I'll try to get both lab, well, both of my lecture sessions to be here at the same time. Which will be tight. I mean, we'll see how it works out. Yeah. Uh, on the day of the midterm, after you're done with the test, uh, you're done. Lecture, or you're done. No, no, no. I, it, it's, 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 uh, no, you're done. You're done. All I can say, I'll tell you this, I've told some of the other students this already, but, um, when I was, in fact, we're going to talk about this person that I'm going to be giving you because they have, when we get to photosynthesis, there's a cycle named after him. He got the Nobel Prize for this, but he, he was teaching the chemistry class I was taking at Berkeley back at, well, we're talking 117 years ago, but you know, <laughs> when, you know, and I was on a way to his organic chemistry class, you know, yeah. and hit it in the headlines of the Chronicle Calvin wins Nobel, you know, and you can't, I forgot who won this class, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, he's an incredibly famous I'm a chemist, I mean, he was well known all over the world, but he got a Nobel Prize for his work on photosynthesis. My point about him, though, was he was a very good teacher, but he was hard. First of all, there's a course that you just had to memorize and memorize and memorize all these chemical reactions, organic reactions, and oh my god. But we had six midterms over the semester. <laughs> it was an hour and a half lecture like this. And we would have, um, we'd have, we'd come for the test, okay? He'd lecture for 45 minutes, and then we'd have a 45 minute midterm, which included all the stuff from the previous midterm through the 45 minutes of the lecture we had that day. That's <laughs> Oh my God! You know it was rough. I mean, it was it was definitely a tough way. He to was trying to pack a lot of stuff it, in oh, there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Ooh. And and uh, um, the, the, but it was back. That was back in the days of Berkeley. Where, well, it's probably still this way. I don't know. But it's so cutthroat. It was awful. Uh, the, uh, someone told me. I don't know if this Berkeley's is true. Berkeley's not cutthroat. But the, the, out of the like 800 students, four people got an A. Um, there, there was a B range about like that, a C range about like that, a D range about an F range about like that, I mean, she, yeah. and this little tiny A range. I got a B. I was so happy. I thought that was, <laughs> <laughs> I was right on top. <laughs> anyway, no. So, but no, we're done. We're done. And once you take the test, you're going to be done. I, I don't. I don't think it would happen necessarily, but you can take that. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was just another story. But yes, yes, question. No scantrons, no, I'd all be on the test. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'll be writing. Some of it written, some of it be short answers, some of it be little short essays, yes, but I'll be on the, on the test. be several pages long and stuff like that. Um, is, email me at any time with questions about whatever, you know, about the on the test or what, what, if something doesn't make sense or, you know, if you're going through the study guide and you want to you know, make sure you understand it, email me. Don't, don't hesitate to email me. So we won't uh, Friday. We, this is we're not going to be here Friday. Uh, we might even have a nice day Friday. Who knows? But uh, I was hoping we'd have you know time to have office hours on Friday afternoon. Quad here, whatever this is called. But, yeah, we couldn't last time because it was raining. Now it's a holiday, and next Friday we're going to have a study session. But whatever, we'll get to it sometime. Any other questions? Reminding you that this you know this Friday is a holiday, right? This Friday. Is a holiday. And Monday is a holiday. Next Monday. And I did mention to you, I think, last time that you know, the schools, the elementary and high schools, on they, they have the whole week off, right? President's Week. Uh, and I said, I don't care if you bring it. <laughs> Do you with me because it's pretty hard sometimes when you have the kids are not in school and you're in school. Um, yeah, what question did you say? Do you know if Colette is actually having lab on the Tuesday? Because a lot of people aren't going to, my other two professors aren't here on Tuesday. They aren't? Yeah, they're being selfish and taking personal days for the first time in probably Leave forever, that. right? <laughs> but uh, uh, I should probably email her and ask her. I guess that she is. Okay, uh, okay. I doubt that she's not at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak for her, but I doubt that she's at it. Okay. So, okay. So, um, any other questions? But you can email her. Yeah, email her to find out. Yeah. Um, no questions? No. Let's do it. All right, let's, let's, oh gosh, this <coughs> stuff is actually rather complicated stuff because it's some of this mathematical rather than. Oh, that's the easy part. Really something that you can conceive of. So we have to kind of use analogies to make some sense out of it. But let's start with energy, first of all. Um, so, yeah, energy. Energy comes in all kinds of different forms. So let's write some of these things about energy. Let's say. Heat. Energy, yeah, it comes in different forms. But let me give you a couple of examples first here. Different forms. For example, what we call kinetic energy. Potential. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Yeah. Uh, potential, potential energy. energy. This is energy that, it, it, potential meaning is not, you, you're not getting, not seeing the effect of the energy right now, but there is a potential for it to, to change. Uh, um, uh, example would be uh, a rock on a hill. <laughs> Yeah, let's say you have a, a hill here, and it's kind of a little ledge right here, and there's a little rock up there. A rock, a rock, a rock. There's a rock. There's a rock that's sort of sitting there, but it's above the ground. I mean, so this is a hill, and so here is, you know, the, the level part of the ground. It's unstable, right? I mean, it's sort of, sort of sitting on a little lip right there. It's not really too, too stable. And if you just gave it a little bit of a shove, you know, then the thing would roll down the hill, and then that potential energy, the energy because it's above the surface of the uh, earth, you know, will change in kinetic energy as it, as it rolls down the hill. Okay, That's, that kind of thing is, is what they call potential energy. We have potential energy in other forms too. Um, I mean, you know, we have what we call chemical energy uh, in, in chemical bonds, or let's just say gasoline. We think of gasoline as having chemical energy. It's potential energy in the sense that it's just sitting there as gasoline. But once you turn on your car and get it to burn and get those pistons to move and get those tires to move. You know, that's when you change it into kinetic energy, for example, and get here to class, right? So um, anyway, so, so we have 
all kinds of, of um, different synergy. And in our body, uh, well, I mean, this is not just our body. I mean, this is true of anything. But let's just take some examples. Um, uh, maybe I should call them types of energies. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The word is for our body. Uh, but we'll say uh, forms, forms of energy that are important for us would be things like chemical energy. You know, I didn't write that one. Maybe this is a word. Chemical energy. And, and this is, you know, things like, uh, um, as I said, you can think of gasoline for your car. That would be chemical energy. But in our own bodies, if you think of sugars or fats or whatever, those are chemical energies that, that you know, these are bonds, these are covalent bonds that are you can you break and get some uh, usefulness out of them. Um, so chemical energy, we'll say, for example, uh, sugar or gasoline or whatever. Electrical energy is another one. Uh, and, and this is in our body. We, we, we uh, uh, have a charge. Well, for example, um, neurons, the cells in our nervous system, they're sending signals from one place to another in your body. Uh, the signal is a form of electrical energy. It's not the same kind of electricity that you get when you plug in something in the wall socket. What's happening in the wall socket? That's uh, you you have Let's move. you you have uh, well the electrons are electrons right. yes electrons so that's that's electrons and they're moving incredibly fast yeah um in our in our bodies you know when we use uh, electrical energy such as nerve transmission um, to make muscles function we need that we need electrical uh, signals too um it's not electrons it's ions that are moving okay usually sodium and potassium ions. Ions. Now, an ion is tiny, but an ion is enormous compared to an electron. Again, th th this is the hard thing to think about is when I keep giving these size relationships, I say large molecule, small molecule, or whatever. But again, it's in relation to whatever we're talking about. If you're thinking of an electron, those are minuscule. I mean, incredibly tiny compared to something as big as an ion. And an ion is tiny compared to a molecule like an amino acid. An amino acid is tiny compared to a big molecule like a protein. It's a, you know, we go on and on, as I've said before. Anyway, the point is that when we're talking electrical energy, you know, we're, we're usually talking about uh, you know, nuclear ions, for example. But we'll also see, uh, when we get to cell respiration and stuff, we'll talk about electrons, electron transport. So it's, it's all still there. Okay. So we will come back. Yeah. Not yeah. today. You know, but there are other other kinds of things too. Heat, you can say heat. Thermal, thermal, yeah. Heat, as you said, you know, and there's there are other forms. We'll just say etc. When in doubt, just put etc. Sure <laughs> <laughs> but there's all kinds of things we can come up with. So so okay so um, this is a, this is an important idea because in order for things to work, you know, we have to have well, let's say. Biological systems or whatever it could be your car too. It's not a biological system, but it could be a car. In order for them to work, you have to have some form of energy that you can then use to do whatever you want to do. In your car, you want your car to move. You know, in your in your cells, you might want to make some proteins. You might want to contract some muscles. You know, whatever it might be. But you want to have some form of energy that you can use and convert it. In some way, that the energy that's released can be used to do what you want to do. Um, because here's the deal: we'll, we'll talk about the laws of thermodynamics. There's three laws. We're going to talk about the first two. But um, in any reaction, okay, any chemical reaction, some heat is given. Now, the heat for our for practical purposes, you will say the heat is wasted. In, I don't want to say the term "wasted energy." That's not really the term. Uh, so not true. Uh, but but um, useful. We say useful. So I will use the word "useful energy." Um, so it, let's just say that you, you, you're talking about your car, and gasoline is the energy. But of course, it's chemical energy. It's chemical bond energy, right? And you want to break it down. You want to burn it. And then, of course, by burning it, you're going to 
get those pistons in them and all that. Um, well, about what percentage uh, of the energy, of the, the actual energy in the gasoline is converted from chemical energy to uh, uh, kinetic energy? I mean, any ideas on that? It's I, not very high. I was going to say it's not just a lot of carbon. Like something like in the 20s or some, 20 percent or something like that. Maybe higher than that. I'm not sure. Diesels are higher. Diesel is, is a little higher in terms of, in other words, the amount of energy in the gasoline, the available energy that's there if you broke it down. But how much of it is converted into actually useful energy, meaning moving your car, versus coming out as heat? Yeah, because it's, it's small. Is anyone? I don't know the number, but it's uh, it's it's higher. It's, I think it's closer to four m mechanic, but it's because of the compression, and you do get. But is it like twenty percent, or is it, I mean, it's not very high. It's higher. It's higher than than gas. I think it's like forty percent. That's diesel. Yeah, that's diesel. what I mean. Yeah, yeah diesel is like forty. And, and but gasoline engines are is is not as it might even be like seventeen or something. Yeah, 17, something I, like that. I was a mechanical engineer once, I know. And I, as I say, I can't remember the exact number. But my point is <sighs> that if you look at the total energy available in something like the, the gasoline molecule, and then how much of that energy can actually be used to do the work you want to do, which in the case of your car is to move, uh, it's a small percentage. And the vast, all the rest of it comes out as heat, you know, and the heat's not useful to you. Uh, uh, you need to get rid of it, otherwise you'll melt your engine. So anyway, so the point <laughs> is that, that uh, you always produce some heat. So so that's something to think about. That, that's, a, that's an absolute. Um, you can always lose some of the available energy as heat. But let's, anyway, let's talk about, let me, actually, I want to write that down. Let's write that down. Let's talk about that. So... In every every chemical reaction, so why are we talking about chemical reactions? Why is this a big deal to us? In biology? Yeah. <laughs> it's what we're married. I mean, yeah, we are a walking chemical reaction. Exactly. And the way I state it, in my very unpoetic way of talking about a cell, not at all poetic, but accurate, a cell is a bag of chemical reactions. Okay, so you've got thousands of chemical reactions occurring in your cells every second of the day. Thousands of these chemical reactions. Um, and so, in every chemical reaction, some energy is lost as heat. Now, if it's all lost as heat, then of course you wouldn't get any work out. We want to be able to get some work out. In other words, we want to be able to do something. If it's a cell, maybe the cell wants to buy. Maybe the cell wants to, to move. Maybe the cell wants to whatever, you know, um, produce some protein. So there's all kinds of things the cell might want to do. And you certainly want to, the cell wants to do that. It doesn't want to just burn some sugar and have it all come off as heat. That's what the company can do. So in every chemical reaction, some energy is lost as heat. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, We'll come back to this with respect to all these things here. It's all, it's all going to tie in together. Let's talk about the law of thermodynamics. This is a field that was developed in about the mid-1800s <laughs> by various chemists and physicists and all that. And, you know, they came up with these three laws of thermodynamics. One of the laws uses a term, the second law, a term that is, doesn't... It's not something you can really explain. It's called entropy. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But it, it, we, can, we can use analogies to try to make sense out of it. But it, it only makes sense mathematically. So we'll, we'll still deal with it. It's okay. But let's start with the first law. Let's start with the first law of thermodynamics. And I just want you to know the basic idea of these laws and the implication of these laws for life, for living systems. Okay. First law of thermodynamics. And actually, one of the things I think I put on that, if you looked up the outline of my CRs, you know, does life follow the laws of thermodynamics? We'll come back to that idea. First law of thermodynamics, um, energy can neither be created nor, nor, destroyed. Dest nor destroyed. Energy can neither be created or destroyed. But it can change forms.
In other words, it could change from potential energy to uh, kinetic energy. It could change from chemical energy to heat or something like that. You know, you can change form. But the total energy of the system is the total energy of the system. Uh, and you're not, you can't, you can't generate, you can't make energy. Uh, you can't destroy energy. You, you can just change forms. Of it, okay? okay, we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll see how what this world this means after we get into it. Second law. Second law. Um, yeah, let's first of all talk about this term entropy. I'll give you this term entropy. Uh, Entropy. Here's the way they describe it. This is the analogy. And it's an, a nice analogy to use because we can at least understand the analogy. But as I said, the term really only makes sense mathematically. Um, they talk about how ordered something is versus how <coughs> random something is. Okay? So okay. let's just say you have a deck of cards. If you have a deck of cards, and let's just say you you look at the cards there, ace two three four five up to up to king of, of, of spades, and then right after that's ace two three four five all the way up to king of diamonds, right after that clubs and hearts. You you say that's a very ordered system, right? Those those things are in some special order. Um, what if I just take those cards, throw them up like that, and they go all over the place? When I was a kid, we called that the two card, card pickup. Pick you know, you go pick up all these cards. That's what, what 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 kind of order are they going to be in now? Total disorder, right? Mm -hmm. No 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 special order. So the first situation, they were in, in, in uh, they were in a very ordered form. In the second situation, if they threw them up, they're in a very they're in a disordered form. Entropy, the idea of entropy in terms of our analogy is that it measures how ordered something is, mm -hmm. or how much disorder. However, what you can say whichever way you want. So we can say entropy, we'll say, is a measure of, we'll, we'll say the disorder. Right? You could say it either or consistency or, or just say again. consistency, but that's not really right. You know, you know, yeah, it all sort of means the same thing. Yeah. It's a measure of the disorder of the system. The more disordered, the higher the entropy. Okay. The more disorder, the higher the entropy. Or I could have said the higher the entropy, the more disorder. And so, you know, so the entropy would just be a measure. It's a measure, you know, it's a measure. Uh, so, presumably, something like, you know, you. you, you that, deck, that original deck of cards that was had would have a relatively low entropy, and then we throw it up and you gather them all up and you have your relative. It's relative measured as a number so. value. It's, it's well, it's, it's not. It's um, the units are mole per meter or something. I forget the exact unit. I've forgotten the units. It's been so long since yeah. I've used it. But it, it's got a, it's a certain. You're measuring it in a certain uh, 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 values. I mean, okay. I mean, you know. It's not just a number. Okay. So you have to have the units. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, you, if you want to use the word principle, that's just fine. As I said, it, technically it's a mathematical construct that they develop by, because of the way they develop thermodynamics, but then trying to make sense out of it. And that's what, you know, that's, and that's, you can say it the way you said it is fine. I mean, as long as you, it, it, we're trying to use an analogy that makes some sense. So, you know, like I went into my daughter's, my little nine-year-old daughter's room yesterday, the other day. High entropy in that room. <laughs> Total mess. <laughs> Very high entropy. Clean your room! <laughs> she did. She cleaned it. So it's much lower entropy. But um, let's, let's put the second law, and then let's see what, what happened here. So here's the deal. And the, the second law says that... Uh, in any reaction, it could be chemical reaction, physical reaction, whatever. In any reaction, the the amount of entropy increases. Okay. So, in any reaction, the amount of entropy increases. 
I should say the interview. I should say the amount of interest. Say the interview. But really, we should be talking about the entropy of the system. So if the entropy is increasing, we're saying the disorder increases, all right? So we really should be talking about the entropy of the system. And in order for my daughter's room, in order for the oh, entropy to go sense. down in her room, she had to do some work to clean it up. And by doing work, she's she is making more entropy in other aspects. In other words, she's made her room neater, but she's used a lot of energy to do it. And she's given off a lot of heat and a lot of CO2 and stuff like that. So so the entropy of the system is what we're really talk, talking about. In, in any reaction, the entropy increases. And to be technical, I should say the entropy of the system. And this is an important idea. But let's just, but let's, let's, before we get into all this detail, let's just think about it for just a minute. The entry of the system increases. Now, when the people were developing thermodynamics, you know, they were they were doing things like, like uh, 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 working on steam engines and doing all kinds of measurements of heat and how much you know what they put into it and how much heat, you know heat came out, how much work they got out, and they were doing all these measurements and everything. And so that was fine. They came up with these laws. The third law, by the way. Says that the, I'm not going to write it down, but the third law says that the entropy of the universe is, is going to reach a maximum. It's, it's getting, it's always getting higher. Um, the way some people said, the way they, what's the word? Some people do it in this. They say the first law says that you can never win; you can only break even. <laughs> like if you're gambling, yeah. you can only break even. The second law says you can never win at all. And the last law is simply saying that, that we all lose or something. Like that. <laughs> I'm not sure. Something like that. But anyway, so 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 when they developed thermodynamics, they were working with physical kinds of systems and said things like you know, steam engine and all. And uh, you know, it all made perfectly perfectly good sense. But then the, those people started talking to the biologists, and the biologists were making you know getting better understanding of cells and and, and you know multicellular organisms and all that. And the thing about a cell is it's incredibly ordered. What would we say in terms of entropy? Low in terms entropy. Of low. It's incredibly ordered. And they're going, wait a minute. How does that violate this, this, the second law of thermodynamics? Is it, it's, it's, it's so ordered. I mean, that's the thing about it. The, the, the you know, biological systems are not random. They're incredibly ordered. Um, and so is it violating the laws of thermodynamics? And at first they thought maybe it did. I mean, they were trying to understand it. But then, it's this, see what I put up here, the, the, the entropy of the system increases. How did that be, How does the entropy of a cell stay low? I mean, in other words, why is it ordered? You have to use you know, something, you're, you're, you're burning energy. Uh, and you say, okay, you're burning energy, but my God, then it, 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 you're still, you're still, you know, you should be increasing that that energy of the system. But what is driving all the life on Earth? We talked about the other day, something coming from out there. Yeah, the sun. The sun. The sun is giving this constant input of energy, and it's that constant input of energy. That is allowing the photosynthetic plants and and and, and uh, bacteria to to make <coughs> sugar. And then yeah, other organisms can eat that sugar and burn it and do what they need to do to keep an ordered system. But in order to have that ordered system, we have to have this constant and ordered energy from the sun. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make some sense? It's it's really kind of a it's a profound <sighs> idea once once you see it. And it, when once the people this is back in 1800 they go. Oh, if you look at the system, of course, we are making a lot of entropy around here. You can just look at the trash and stuff like that. But I mean, it's, you know, heating up the atmosphere and all these other things happen. So we, the system, the entropy is definitely increasing. But there are various parts of the system, and we're part of the system. I may say we, meaning living things, cells, 
you know, and those living things, they can be, have a lower entropy because this entropy around them is increasing. And, and the only reason we can keep this happening is we have this constant input of energy from the sun. So let's actually write this down. This is kind of an important idea. So, so does life violate the laws of thermodynamics? Life is very, 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 very organized. Organized. Or you can say ordered if you want. That's a word you're using ordered. Life is very ordered, it's very organized. But can only exist or persist, if you want to use the word persist, yeah, I don't care. I would say it can only exist because of the constant input of this energy from the sun. And of course the the sun is running down. I mean, you know, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. Um, I hope. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, what they think of maybe the sun has another 5 billion years or something like that. I don't know. And then we get into a white dwarf or some other kind. I don't know what they, I can't remember all the details. But anyway. Well, they have so, the date. So, yeah, yeah. But, so I, I don't think we need to worry about it. But no. as long as the sun is out there functioning. Uh, and as we get this constant input of energy, and we can do it. But if the sun suddenly stopped, how long would life last on Earth? I mean, we, we have a certain amount of you know, uh, material in the biosphere, and various organisms can eat other organisms. Well, there's no energy. Know, maybe a couple of months or something. I don't know how long life would last, but not terribly long, because, you know, I mean, <laughs> we need that constant input. So anyway, that that's this is a it's a pretty important idea, really, to be honest. It's a pretty important idea uh, about how how you know, life functions and it's 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 important that you keep in mind you know, that, that we need that constant input of energy. Anyway, okay. Let's let's go on. Let's talk about it. Fancy words, exergonic and endergonic. Aren't those nice words? Or, yes, yes. Not actually what metabolism has to do with it. I haven't gotten there yet, though. But I, I will, and then you will. And if you don't, you guys don't. But I think you will. <laughs> and this, it's all, this is all going to be, it is all going to fit together. It really does fit together. I mean, somewhat peripherally, but it's, it really does fit together. At least that's my thought. Okay, so let's go on to chemical reactions first, because we, we need to start general ideas, and then we'll get specifically to the living thing that comes after. So, remember I mentioned to you about, well, I'll come back to that idea, but about how, yeah, forming, for, um, covalent bonds, remember I talked about how things said, ah, I'll come back, I don't want to talk about that now, I'll come back to that. No, really uh, yeah, yeah, let's just, let's just do these chemical reactions. Let's talk about. Oops. <laughs> chemical reactions. Um, and these are in, 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 in general endergonic, let's do this one, right? Endergonic reactions and extragonic. Did I put it in the right order? No, I think it's the exact opposite. It doesn't really matter to me. Exergonic. Endergonic and exergonic. In general, what these mean. The in, endo, inside, in, ex, out, out, okay. Well, here we're talking about heat, okay, uh, as far as uh, you know, how the, if the reaction is going to work. Or I should say, not just heat, sorry. We're talking about energy and all that, if the reaction is going to work. Um, 
And X, let's do the exergonic first. Can we come, come back to it? Do you have a question? Well, I, uh, my chemistry teacher called it exergenic. Are those interchangeable bonds? Exergenic. Okay. Um, well, exergenic. I mean, usually we use a G in to form. And, and as it would make sense. I don't know. Are those interchangeable? Exergenic, exergonic. I mean, because it's a different word. He wouldn't have said genic if he was using this one. Right. Um, okay, let, let me let me write this stuff and let me think about what I'm writing. First of all, exergonic means that the the uh, when the, the, the reaction occurs, uh, um, the reaction wants to occur and energy is given off, usually as heat. So, so the reaction. I'm going to put it, it this wants wants to occur and heat is given off or energy is given off usually in the form of heat it could be given off in another form but let's just do this and energy uh, is given off and I'm going to put it in parentheses and usually me the, the, the what's given off, I mean, what, what it's formed is more stable than it was. So you're using things that are fairly unstable, you're reacting, you want to react, what's left over is, 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 is more stable. And the uh, um, products of the reaction usually are more stable. And the reactions. Now, by the way, what we're saying is, hey, the reactants get together. Reactants react. <laughs> the reactants react, giving the product, giving off products, giving off the products. This is. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a reaction. These the things are going to work fit together. Those are the, the reactants in the form of props. That's what's given off. So I'm saying that that, that usually what's given off in, a, in an exergonic reaction would be um, more stable than endergonic. Okay. Uh, and and the reaction wants to go. When I say wants, that's with respect to thermodynamics. And that's with respect to the amount of energy available in the products versus the energy available in the reactants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, 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 you need to worry about it. Exergenic. Did you say exergenic and endergenic? Yeah. I think you talking about heat. Well, I Googled it. Yeah, and oh, yeah. It only comes up with exergonic. Exergonic? Yeah. I wonder why so, it said exergenic. It doesn't, it doesn't even say exergenic. No. You wonder why they said exergenic? <laughs> Maybe he just likes the word better. Because <laughs> usually the GEN part means to form. Form, yeah, gen, genesis. Exergenic forms heat and gives it off. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I'm not English, sure. English or English. Oh, okay. Well, then, oh, well, then, okay. Well, that could be the problem. That could be the problem. Okay. Yeah. Because I had the first, I haven't heard that. I haven't ever heard that used. Okay. In endergonic, the reaction doesn't want to go. Okay, in other words, you put these two things together, they don't really want to react. So in order to make them go, you've got to put energy into the system, you've got to force them to go. Okay, so you've got to put energy into the system. So instead of energy being given off, as in an exergonic, you have to put energy into the system to make it go. So here the reaction doesn't uh, want to go. So, energy must be put into the system to make it happen. <coughs> must be put into the, uh, must be put in, oh, I saying, must be put in, into, oh, that's into the reaction, whatever. Must be put into the reaction to make it happen. And usually what happens, usually the, the 
products are, you know, are more uh, are less stable than the reactants in this case. Here, the products are more stable. Oh, I said that the products are more stable. The products are less stable than the reactants usually. Yeah. I was, is that what the large hadron collider is for? Is that how they do the energonic? You said something with the large hadron collider. Yeah. Well, you said add it. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think that's how they do it. No, that's this is that, no, that's the reaction. Just chemical reactors, just normal chemical reactors. Oh, maybe and I'm talking about trying to make atoms. Sense we're talking about. It does all make sense when we're talking about metabolism. Right okay. I'm just thinking about. The first, okay, so I'll give you an example. Let me just write this down so that you know, I'll give you an example. We're talking okay. About. So, okay. Um, so usually. The products are less stable than the reactants. Um, yeah, the products are less stable than the reactants. I'll give you examples so that can make sense. Okay. You know, it's not sinking in the reactants. Okay. So. There's a neat um, uh, a, a really neat thing at uh, what was it, Lawrence Hall Science, and you, they, they had these things other places, not just Lawrence Hall Science, but they have this big kind of a clear glass container, and and you push a button, and there's some water, and an electrolysis thing starts to work. What's water made out of? Hydrogen oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen, right? So if you put, if you zap the water, or you're putting those uh, water and have electric electrical signal going in, you can actually break some water molecules up into hydrogen atoms and we're actually hydrogen molecules, H2, and oxygen molecules, O2. Okay. And so it, you know when you push the button, it, this this electrolysis starts to happen, and the, uh, the hydrogen gas and the, and the and hydrogen gas splits at one end, and they have a little thing where it collects, and you get Oxygen gas plugs at the other end of the way they have this thing set up. So you have oxygen gas in one thing, hydrogen gas in the other. Now, water is very stable, right? Water is very stable. Um, in order to break it apart, they had to, you had to put energy into the system. And it, so, so you're putting energy into the system to break it apart into oxygen and uh, hydrogen. Both oxygen and hydrogen are highly reactive. They're very reactive. Water is not reactive, it's very stable. Okay, so you had to put energy in to, to break the water up, that it was endergonic, and the products uh, are much less stable. You know, the products would, uh, of that electrolysis, the products would be oxygen and hydrogen, uh, much less stable than the water, right? I get it. Now, you put the water and the, I mean, you put the oxygen molecules and the hydrogen molecules together. They don't just immediately form water, by the way. They have to be kind of just given a little kick. And the kick is just like an electric spark or something like that. There are other ways of doing it, too. You can use a catalyst. But anyway, but if you just give them a little electric spark, so what they would do, the next thing they do is they would let the oxygen gas and, and hydrogen gas mix together. So there you have them. And they'll sit there for a while because as the gas molecule, they'll, they'll, they'll sit there. But then you just it, you give a little uh, electrical spark, you know, just a little electric spark. You have a noise about that loud. And this is just a few, you know, this is a small amount of water that, that was made in the gas. You have a noise about that loud, that's, that, that's just all this extra heat being given up. And, and then you have these few drops of water molecules. Um, and, and so now suddenly that reaction then was exergonic because you had these very unstable molecules, and you had to just start the molecule, and then the whole thing goes, and the product, the product which is water, was very stable versus the reactants, which were oxygen and hydrogen. And of course, energy is given off when that happens, too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one example. Let's take the example in our, in our cells. We take something like, well, let's, no, let's take, let's take what the plant's doing. Is taking carbon dioxide, this is photosynthesis, is taking carbon dioxide and trying to make it into sugars. Carbon dioxide is very stable. 
how are you going to get, how are you going to possibly get that to happen? You're going to have to have some input of energy. So you're going to have this endergonic reaction, and that input of energy, of course, is from the sun. You know, all the tricky little things happening with the chloroplasts. Uh, and, but you will actually make uh, um, sugar. Now the plant, or if you eat the plant, you will, will can take the sugar, and now we have a, a molecule that's, that's got a lot of available energy in it. The sugar molecule, it's very energetic. Again, it's pretty stable, it, 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 but it can react. You just have to give it a kickstart, and, and you, you, know, you can give it a kickstart by putting it on the stove and heating it up, or you can give it a kickstart by eating it and having your cell break it down, and we're going to be talking about that. Not today, but we will be talking about it. And of course, what's going to happen? The, 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 if you put it on the stove and just start to heat it up, the whole thing will go. You get a lot of energy coming off. And what are the products when you break down sugar? CO2 in the water. Again, so so it's going to be exergon, it's going to give off a lot of heat, and, and you're going to get these products which are very stable, CO2 in the water. All right. What's the big deal about this? Why am I talking about this? Because that's what's happening to your cells all the time. Um, so let's let's actually talk about this in tablets. Now we're going to talk about metabolism. You asked me about it, so you will understand what I'm talking about here. So metabolism. We, you know, ordinarily, metabolism, or most of the time, people just talk about metabolism, okay? And, and, and if you say, what, is, what are you talking about when we're talking about metabolism? Just all the reactions that are occurring in your body, all these chemical reactions, and what's happening in your body, okay? Or in a cell, you can just talk about metabolism in a cell. But, in reality, we break it down into two parts, metabolism. We break it down into one part called catabolism. I'll just judge it the same word as that by saying it first. It doesn't matter which one I put first. Catabolism and anabolism. Okay. Catabolism means the breaking down of something. And anabolism means building up. So one, one you're breaking things apart, the other you're putting it together. Um, <coughs> bodybuilders, they like to take so-called anabolic steroids. Have you heard that term? Uh -huh. Some of you have heard of anabolic yeah. steroids. It's not a testosterone, there's some derivatives of testosterone or various other so-called male hormones, uh, and the idea of if you take those, I mean, testosterone itself is an anabolic steroid, but what they're doing is taking extra, not, I mean, males make testosterone, females make testosterone, but they make small amounts, males make larger amounts. But if you're, if you're somebody who wants to be a bodybuilder, somebody, you take, take it exogenously, you take extra. And then you have to work out, of course, but the point is that you're building up muscle protein, and you can, you know, you see the bodybuilders with these giant muscles, you know, and it's incredible what they can do, whether you like it or not, at the point, but it is incredible to see what can be done. I love music, obviously. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, what, what, you know, what can be done with, you know, you take the, the so called anabolic steroids, and then you take, uh, uh, and then you have to work out and stuff like that, but you can just build up the muscles so much faster. Most sports, you know, these things are not allowed, although they don't always do adequate testing. They keep trying to get new derivatives and stuff like that that might be able to be used. But anyway, so, so, but that's one way to remember which one is which. Anabolism means you think anabolic steroids and making muscle protein, building up protein. But anyway, here's the deal. In your body, there's constant breaking down, constant building up. Catabolism, most catabolic reactants are exergonic. Okay, so these are usually exergonic. You had a question. Did you want to? It's a statement that's made from full testosterone. Is, is it? It's full testosterone. The full testosterone? Yeah. Is that what they're using? Yes. In why uh, full taurine? Why are we talking about? Human. Are you that? Exactly. Oh, he's talking about in the supplements. Yeah. Yeah. Supplements. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, I don't know how how easily obtained these things are or not, but it, it, let me just say that. Because I had some students years ago, who, you know, a guy who was doing bodybuilding, who wanted to, where can I get some of those, those 
supplements. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's legal. GNC. But I also said, you want to be somewhat careful because you're taking something exogenously, meaning from the outside, not that you're not making. If you start to take it, this is male I'm talking to. I said, your testes will start to shrink. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that it's my spine go higher, but uh, <laughs> and I don't think that necessarily would happen. To it. But I was, you know, I was going to say that as a joke. But anyway, uh, so it's not something you necessarily will do. Although if you stop taking it, there will be a lag curve, but then it will the test you will get back to what the size they were. Which was, hey, it's not something I, I would recommend myself. I'm not in the mind of a But Cat Hamill was okay. I said, usually, usually exergonic reactions. So the exergonic don't need the kick. Say, say a little louder. I'm sorry. The exergonic don't need the kick. Oh, okay. Now, the, a lot of the kick, the kick is, is something that has to do with what they call reaction uh, activation energy, and I, I, I'll try to get to that and make some sense out of it. But some some things, okay, sugar, for example, and and catabolism are breaking down, and I'm going to put this. That, that was what I was going to talk about. Is for example, for example, burning sugar. I mean, I mean, Using sugar in our body. When I say burning, I could say metabolizing sugar. Uh, uh, but you know, when, if you put sugar on the stove and heat it up, that's you think of that as burning sugar. But we're doing the exact same thing in our cells with sugar, except that instead of doing it in one big like that because it's real hot, we're breaking it down step by step by step by step in a, in a very controlled way. But I'll use the word burning. As long as you understand that I'm in, in, in cells, we're talking about very ordered step work, stepwise, you know. Uh, and they do need a kick, uh, which I probably won't talk so, about in this class. So both need a kick. Well, but the kick, the kick, it, it, it depends. I mean, different reactions may need the, the, the kick started, but the kick start, even if you have to kick start it, you'll get that. You, 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 you get anything you put into the kick start, you'll get You're that back. if it's an extra time reaction. I didn't tell you that. So I always said about a kick meaning that you know like 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 sugar. You take sugar sitting there on your on your on your shelf, it's very stable. But it's got a lot of available energy in it. You just have to do something to say, okay, let's get started burning, such as heating it on the stove, or let's eat it and take it into our cells and do something there which has to do with phosphates and all this. Uh, and and that will get it to get out of its stable form. It's still the same molecule out from out of a stable form, and that's the kickstart essentially. So the difference between so, endergonic is that it's more likely to do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, endergonic reactions want to go, but as I said, sometimes they they need to just be kicked because they're just I don't want to, I don't want to hang out for a while. No, no, I want you to do it now. So you kickstart them. No, sorry. Okay. It, it's a little. It, it, it has to do with. Uh, but not all reactions need a kickstart. No, no, some will just when you pour water on sodium, together. it just right. yeah, it does it. Palladium and well, yeah. And others, you just need to kind of just nudge them up there, you know. Okay. Gotcha. And, and so you don't. So it's something I don't want you to worry about <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's a little more complicated than it might seem. <laughs> and it, the term is is activation energy, and, and I didn't really necessarily want to get into that. Okay. okay. But but let's say. Breaking down catabolism. What are the things we break down? We break down sugars, we break down fats. Those are our main, two main energy sources. They're not our only energy sources, but they're our two main energy sources. Uh, breaking down, for example, sugar <coughs> and fats. And we say, we say, break them down, what do we say? For energy. Well, um, but what we're really talking about is breaking down for energy. To, to make energy, to get some energy in some form that we can use to do something. What do we want to do? We might want to grow. We might want to run. We might want to uh, make some new proteins. We might want to uh, 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 make some new cells, you know. So so when, when I say break it down for energy, it is potential energy. It's chemical energy, right? You take, these, you take uh, any of these things like gasoline, sugar, fat. You've got potential energy. You've got chemical energy in the form of all these Covalent bonds. It took energy to put those guys together. So if you can break those bonds apart, you're going to get energy out. But if we just did it, you know, as I said, if we just heated some sugar on the stove, it would convert to CO2 and water with a lot of heat coming off. A lot of heat. If we just did that in our cells, it's not useful. We just make our cells really hot. 
But our cells want to be able to make proteins. Our cells want to be able to make new cells. Our cells want to make new DNA, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, so when I say, if I say break, I mean the way we typically say it, we want to break these things down for, for energy, but we want to break it down in such a way that we can get some energy in a useful form. Okay, it's nice to have sugar to eat. That's great, and we there's all this chemical bond energy there available. But when we break it down, we don't want all the available energy to come out of heat because it means it doesn't gain anything. It's a lot of heat. Sweat, a uh, heat up. You want more than that. Okay. Um, does this all make sense in just a minute? We're getting right down here. So, so anabolism is the building up. I'll say, for example, synthesizing proteins. That's just one example. Synthesizing <coughs> proteins. And the idea of the bodybuilding is they're synthesizing uh, muscle proteins. But in general, I think I said this to you the other day, but if you ask me about, excuse me, if you ask me to give V1, if I had to give one, if I said, what's the most important thing a cell does during the day, and you have to give one answer, I would say synthesize <coughs> proteins. Why is that so important? Because Those proteins stuff. are the worker, worker molecules, yeah. exactly. Okay, anyway. So, so, but synthesizing proteins, synthesizing uh, nucleic acid, synthesizing big carbohydrates, you know, uh, all that would be uh, an anabolic, those would be anabolic reactions. Proteins, or, or we'll say, or nucleic acids. So these are usually um, uh, endergonic reactions. They re need an energy input. And or, 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 what I said, my very unpointed definition of a cell was, or statement about a cell was bag of chemical, yeah, chemical reactions. reactions yeah. And sometimes they're catabolic reactions and sometimes they're anabolic. But here's the real point that, you know, in order to run these anabolic reactions, in order to, which are endergonic, you've got to put energy into the system, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to get the energy. From the catabol built from yeah, catabolic course, reactions, yeah. from the exergonic type reactions. In other words, if we want to make proteins, we need energy in some form so that we can hook amino acids together to make proteins. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to get the energy to do it? Well, we can break down some sugar. Because we're going to get a lot of energy given off when we break down sugar, or fat, it doesn't matter which one. We get a lot of energy if we break them down. But how can I hook up the breakdown of sugar to the buildup of proteins? It's not a direct hookup. Okay? No, I need another system. We need a common currency. Yes, we need the common currency. Guess what? Here it is. <laughs> Did you look at this? Did I feed this to you already? Yeah. I need someone who can use my question. Yes! <laughs> okay, so the question is. What, what, how we, let's actually do this like this. How can they, how are these connected? This is the tricky, this is the trick. I mean, this is the important thing. I mean, I want, I'm, I mean, I want to understand this, that, that, you know, you're constantly doing some catabolic reactions, some anabolic reactions, um, but, but how can you get them to kind of work together? And, and what, you know, exactly as, as Megan said, we need some kind of common currency. And, and they, that common currency is ATP, which I call, exactly call it common currency, I call it the dollar bill of the energy of your, of your metabolic system. So let's first of all talk about what ATP is, and I'll, then I'll give you my little analogy, and then you'll see why, why I'm, I'm talking about it. 
<coughs> so, so the answer, by the way, so the answer is ATP. Big letters there. ATP. But for, what is ATP? It's actually a nucleotide. Does that sound familiar? ATP is a nucleotide. What are nucleotides for? What are they for? No idea. They're the monomers to make some polymer. What are the polymers? Oh. Nucleic acid. See, uh, it, it, once you start studying from the exam, <laughs> then that would come right to you. Yeah, yeah. RNA and DNA. Okay, I remember those. Those are the monomers to make nucleic acids. Now, in particular, ATP is one of the nucleotides used to make uh, um, RNA. Okay. And we haven't really talked about all these, but 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 um, let me just draw a picture. Uh, <laughs> let's see, used to make RNA um, nucleotide, which is probably the most common. I'm going to just say, put it in quotes, energy molecule. Cells. And this is true of most any cell you can, I mean, in, in, in general, it's true of our cells, it's true of bacterial cells, true of fungal cells. It's not the only energy currency that we're going to talk about, I mean, but that's the only one we're talking about. But keep in mind, it's not the only one. There are others, but it's probably the most common. Let me draw a quick picture without you worrying about the details right now. Um, to make, AT, to make uh, ATP, we need what's called ribose, it's bicarbonate sugar. I'm just going to do it like this. This is going to be ribose. Ribose, and that's a bicarbonate sugar. Bicarbonate sugar. Okay, like this. Hooked on to it is an adenine. We'll say more about these molecules when we talk about nucleic acids. Um, but, but that's where you get the A for ACP. A so is adenine. So here's ribose, and then hooked onto that, remember the P with the circle around it? Phosphate. Phosphate. And, and then I'm going to do a funny little thing, a little squiggle with another P, and a squiggle with another P. Yeah, and then ribose. Now, I did I give you this once before? These, did I give you these little squiggles? Mm -mm. Okay, I'm going to do it right now. But notice this is a straight line, a little straight dash thing. What's that mean? It's, it's bonded there. Covalent bond. bond. It's right here, covalent bond. Well, these are, these are covalent bonds also, but. But they're quote high energy bonds. So, so this right here is a high energy bond. So if you see that little squiggle, um, that little squiggle, instead of having a straight line, it means a high energy bond. And here's the deal: it, it takes energy to put things together. And so, if you could, if you broke them apart, you get energy back out again. So let's. Um, so if I broke this bond, for example, right, that that last little bond with that phosphate, a bunch of energy would be given off. All right. Now let me stop for a second and let me give you my little analogy. And the, and and this is I call ATP. This is my term for it. Is the dollar bill? The dollar bill. Of energy metabolism. Or you say it's metabolism, I don't care. And here's, here's my, and I'll give you my little analogy, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. You're a farmer. Okay. So let's say you're a farmer and you raise wheat. Okay, that's fine. And when you, when you, Harvest your wheat, you take it down. So you, you know, it doesn't. You have a neighbor you know that wants wheat, so you take it down to the wheat. And you know, you, you have actually have some 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 pigs, and he raises some uh, some corn. So you say, hey, I, you know, I'll give you some of my wheat, and you give me some corn, and then you know, you can use the wheat to feed your, feed yourself or some other animal, and then I'll take the corn and I'll eat some, and I'll give some of my pigs. And that's just fine. So that works out fine. Do that. But then what if one, one time you go and say, hey, you go down to him and say, hey, I've got a bunch of wheat. Um, I, I, I'm going to trade this to you for some corn. He goes, well, you know, I don't need wheat. 
I need some soybeans. Oh, well, I don't have soybeans. Well, wait a minute. Maybe the guy down the hill there. So you take your wheat down the hill and you say, hey, do you have soybeans? And maybe if he has soybeans, you say, well, let me trade the wheat to you for the soybeans. And then you take the soybeans, if he wants your wheat, and then he, you take the soybean from him. He takes your wheat and takes soybeans. Then you go back to this other guy and say, hey, I've got some wheat now, some soybeans now. Here's the soybeans. I'll trade for the corn. But what if the guy that has the soybeans didn't want wheat? you got to find someone who wants your wheat. So that it's complicated. Yeah. The bartering system is fine <laughs> if it's working in a nice, simple way, but it can get rather complicated. So <laughs> instead of doing that, what do we do? Make you currency. use dollar bills. I mean, in other words, you, you take your wheat, you go to some central marketplace, and you say, okay, I'll sell whoever wants my wheat. I don't care who wants it, but who will care. I'll sell it for X number of dollar bills, and then I'll take those dollar bills, and then I can go buy some corn if I want, or I can go buy some soybean if I want, or I can go buy whatever. You know what I'm saying? So you have this common exchange molecule, dollar bill, that, that you can use, that, you know, you, when you sell something, somebody gives you dollar bills. When you buy something, mm -hmm. you give dollar bills. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the way it is here with these catabolic and anabolic reactions. If, if you're breaking down something like sugars and fats, there's a lot of energy available. And you're going to be breaking it down. Now, if it just all went off as heat. Waste. That'd be a waste. Some of us going to be lost as wheat. Have no, I mean, wheat. Heat. Be lost as wheat and soybeans. No, no. Sorry. Heat. I got to get the right words here. Sorry. So, all right. So you're breaking down. You're breaking down these the, these the, the sugars and fats, and a certain amount of that energy that's available in those sugar molecules, and those fat molecules, a certain amount is going to be lost as heat. You have no choice. But if some of that energy that's given off, you can trap. By making ATP, okay, then you can hold on to that ATP, and then a little bit later, maybe, maybe the, another five minutes later, maybe the, half of the next day, hey, I want to eat, I want to make some proteins, but to make proteins, I'm going to have to put energy into the system. But what if I put energy in the system? Where's that energy I need to put in is ATP? I've got some, okay. So, so the idea is that when you are breaking something down. You make ATP molecules when you are making something, when you're building something up, you that's when you use it. those, mm -hmm. the ATP. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's why it's this common currency. So let's write this down. We still have a couple minutes, I hope. Okay, so I'll write this down. Um, so, um, exactly, yeah. So, so during the catabolic reactions, uh, so, during catabolic reactions, RxN is my abbreviation for reactions, okay? During catabolic reactions, ATP is synthesized or made, ATP is made. Now what have we done? We have trapped some of the energy in these high energy bonds right there. Nice. We've trapped some of the energy that's given off by putting these phosphates onto this, these last two phosphates on here, you know, and there's took energy to make those high energy bonds, took high energy to make those high energy bonds. Now, uh, once we have the ATP, we're going to need some high energy in order to put things together to make ah. proteins. Okay, so now, during these reactions, during the anabolic reactions, in anabolic reactions, uh, ATP is used. And I'm going to say to drive the reaction. In other words, these are reactions that don't want to go. You have to force them to go. And so, so you, but you, you've got this ATP to force it. And I totally get it. These reactions are they're said to be coupled reactions. You know, you'll take a reaction that you want to, you want that doesn't want to go, but you couple it with using ATP. And, and so you make ATP when you're breaking down sugar. You use up ATP when you're synthesizing protein, for example. Or if you're exercising, you're using a lot of ATP. Am I making any sense on this? No, it, it totally does. Does, does I, it sort of make sense how, how, how this is working? We're storing um, energy by catabolism, high energy bonds by connecting the phosphates, yeah. and then breaking them That's apart right. to use it. Yeah, exactly. 
you're, you're, you are, you are basically, you're, you're giving off energy. Some has lost its heat, but some is being stored in these high energy bonds of the ATP. And usually we're talking about the last one. Um, uh, and, and so, so we, and, and by the way, if there's only two phosphates, ADP, ADP, let's just, I'll put this, I'll, I'll say this. If this is removed, if removed, energy is given off. And then you're left with just adenine, ribose, and just two phosphates. That's a DP, adenine, is it called a venison diphosphate? If you remove energy given off, and a DP is left over. I'll say DP remains. So, very quickly then, in, in the catabolic reactions, a little bit over here. So in the catabolic reactions, uh, ADP plus a phosphate is made into ATP, okay? And in an anabolic reaction, we use the opposite, ATP is broken down into A. DP plus phosphate. And of course, in the second case, energy is being given off. In the first case, energy is being put into the energy system, but that's from the breakdown of you know, the back. <laughs> is that, is this sort of making sense? Did that help on that? You said, ask about the metabolism. Did that sort of help, or did I just get too much? <laughs> you got it. Um, now, this last topic ends up a very important topic. You have 10 minutes, right? Yep. At least get the, the beginning of it, maybe most of it. Um, I'm going to erase this stuff here. Okay, here's your right? I got it. We'll, we'll talk about ATP a lot just because it is this energy molecule. And we'll talk about numbers and so on. Like you see how efficient these reactions are in your cells. But we'll do that when we get into respiration and reaction with photosynthesis and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, let's just let's talk about enzymes. Enzymes, biological catalysts. For practical purposes, these are proteins. It turns out there are some RNA molecules that have some enzymatic properties. Um, but but for practical purposes, we're talking proteins. Proteins. One of the many functions of proteins. And I mentioned to you, I think last time, that my guess is, I don't know the number, no one knows, but my guess is that maybe half the proteins we can make are, cat are, are, are enzymes. That's my guess. And that, you know, could be many more than that. I don't know. What's a catalyst? You have catalytic converters in your car, right? What's a catalyst? The catalyst is something that causes a reaction. It, it, it speeds up a reaction. Yeah. It makes a reaction go a lot faster. Okay? So, um, so the catalyst speeds up a reaction. Speeds up a reaction and, and isn't used up in the reaction. In other words, it can, it can keep being, being used over and over again. It isn't like palladium, up. yeah. In a catalytic it's converter. It's used during the reaction, but it's not used up in it. Okay. So this is just true of any catalyst. It speeds up a reaction and it isn't used up in it. Now, what kinds of reactions are we talking about? Reactions in our cells. And the kinds of reactions we're talking about in our cells are breaking down the sugar or building up uh, enzymes, or, I mean, building up uh, amino acids to make proteins or something like that. <sighs> What's our body temperature? You can say centigrade. No, no. Oh, centigrade. 30, 30, oh, 37. 37 centigrade. 986 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, and. and these kinds of reactions that we're talking about that occur in our cells, if you were going to do them in a laboratory situation, you'd be putting them in a test tube and you'd be heating it up to hundreds of degrees, okay, to make these reactions work. In other words, at our temperature, the reactions that we're talking about that occur in your cells, 
for practical purposes, wouldn't be working at all at our temperature. We're too low a temperature. And yet, none of you want to get into a 350 degree oven to see if you can speed up this reaction. I don't recommend that at all. But the point here is that the, 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 it's a very low temperature. So, um, without some kind of a catalyst to speed up the reaction, none of these reactions would work in your cells. As a matter of fact, every single reaction that occurs in your cell, every chemical reaction that occurs in your cell, requires some specific enzymes to allow it to work at our temperature. Mm. Okay. So this is something to keep in mind. Every, every chemical reaction in our cells requires a specific enzyme to allow it to work. So enzymes are absolutely critical. Without enzymes, none of the reactions would be working. There wouldn't be any cells there at all. So these are absolutely critical to function of your cells. Mm -hmm. Which is why I said, if you ask me to name the most important thing your cell is doing at any given moment, I, I would say it's protein synthesis. Because proteins don't last. You make, you make protein now. It might last several days, yeah. last several weeks, maybe, and then it'll break down. But you make new ones. It's constant. It's a normal thing. Constantly, proteins are constantly breaking down, constantly making new ones. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way it is. Um, so anyways, but... but, but uh, so, but you need all these enzymes in order to allow these chemical reactions to work. So, um, how do they work? Ah, I thought I was going to ask. This is sort of tricky. So we can kind of get the idea of this, and then, and then we can. Yeah, I think we'll be able to just do this. Um, now, way back when, oh, I don't know, a week or so ago, I was telling you about how rapidly molecules were moving around, and I think I said to you that. Uh, you know, for these covalent bonds to form, you know, some two things are going to form a covalent bond. They, they, you know, I said molecules are just moving around rapidly. Atoms are moving around rapidly on their own. And there, I mentioned millions and millions and millions of times per second they're moving around, bouncing around, bumping into each other. If two atoms just happen to, to be coming at each other in the right orientation, at the right speed, uh, and all that, and they have to be the right kinds of atoms, and they bump into each other, then you suddenly can get a rearrangement of their, those, those valence electrons to go around the two, so they start sharing things, and you can form a covalent bond. It has to be just exactly right for it to happen. The majority of the time when they bounce each other, they miss. You know? But if, if they do it just right, then they'll get together the right way to realign those electrons to form the covalent bond. I, it's kind of a, I mean, I, we've been talking a lot about heat causing reactions to speed up. And I was, I kind of came up with an answer. Why exactly does that happen? With an enzyme? No, with any. Uh, why does heat cause electrons to move faster? Why well, does no, it particles? Everything move faster. Oh, particle? Why? Yeah. It, it just, it just caused that. It just said that. Randomly. Is that expansion? You're putting all your stuff away, and I got three minutes here now. Wait, just relax. Anyway, it's just you're speeding up all the just the just the random molecular motion. But from the, expansion? The faster you're speeding them up, the more likely, the more often they're going to bump into each other, and the more likely they're going to Great hit friction. each other in the right orientation. And that's why you speed up a reaction, oh. and you're going to increase the chances of it working. But in our, in our cells, we can't increase the temperature. We have to stay at our body temperature. But here's the deal. What enzymes do, in fact, an enzyme, the typical picture of an enzyme that you'll see in a book, and this is an, it's an accurate picture three-dimensionally, it, it'll look kind of like this, and here's the enzyme, and there's this an indentation called an active site. And what happens with the active site, let's just say that you want this reaction A plus B to make C, whatever these things are, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is you have a whole bunch of A's floating around, but, but the A will kind of bind, bind, temporarily bind there, and the B will kind of temporarily bind here, this is the active site here. The B will temp temporarily bind here, and then there's a slight 
change in the in the shape of that molecule so the A and B are forced together the way they need to be in order to react. And if the A and B are just floating around, they're bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. Oh, here I formed it. A and B formed the C. Here's another A and B formed the C. Hey, here's another A and B. But here, <laughs> you're going to have hundreds of these enzymes in a cell. And each one is going to be causing this reaction to occur very fast. So then these guys will form together. You know, and as soon as, as soon as they form together as to make C, then they come out of C, but then it's open up again for another A to come in here, and another B to come in here, and then they form together, you know, and, and it happens very fast. And they can just start catalyzing the reactions to make a whole bunch of them. So, what, so what's happening is they're speeding up the reaction because they're increasing the likelihood for these molecules to be oriented in the right way and bounce together in the right way to realign those phase electrons. Okay. And we're not talking speed here. You, you know, it depends on what we're talking about. There's one, there's one enzyme called catalase, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide. And each enzyme molecule can catalyze one million reactions in a second. I mean, that's fast. Now, that's a very fast one. That's, that's insane. Enzymes, right? that fast. Wow. A million reactions in a second. I know this is the awesome. So, uh, at the beginning of now, Monday's a holiday. So, Wednesday. I wanted to start with enzymes again to make sure that we are clear about the act. I want to tell you a little bit more about the allosteric side. This is important stuff. All right. See you. Have a long weekend. We are.